And uh, we're going to continue there um, in our Sunday night um, uh, Bible study. And uh, just as a, a bit of recap, remember, at this point, David's on the rise and Saul's on the decline. Um, we see that uh, David has been kind of magnified in the eyes of the people. Uh, Saul likes him at first, but then he starts to realize what this means, and that is he is threatened. Um, his kingship is under attack, according to him, and so he wants to stop David. Now, of course, we saw in chapter 19 that Jonathan had a choice to make. Was he going to be loyal to his dad and the king, or to this man that was very clearly God's man? And we see in chapter 19 that he made his choice, and that was to choose David, um, that he wasn't going to let uh, you know, personal relationships or anything like this dictate what God was doing. And so he chose uh, to be loyal to David, and he tried to play the peacemaker. He tried to get Saul to realize what David was. And of course, he would have none of it. And so again, we see that uh, Saul's trying to do him in. We see in chapter 19 that uh, David was delivered in a variety of different ways, and one of which was just a miraculous undertaking of God, that as people went to get him, they just were struck with prophecy. They were prophesying. And so again, we see that God stopped him. In chapter 20, we see that David wants to know once and for all, you know, for me, I would have known by now, but, uh, you know, David wasn't sure. He's always, Saul, just, you know, is he having a bad day? Why is he coming after me? He wants to know for sure, is, David, is Saul tr really trying to kill him? And uh, he has Jonathan go and to kind of do a test to see where Saul's heart was. And sadly, he gets the news back that, indeed, Saul did want David to die. And as a result of that, we see there was a farewell between Jonathan and David in chapter 20. In chapter 21, we see that David was on the run. Uh, we see that he first went to Nob, and he meets with Ahimelech there. He was uh, the priest, and uh, he sees that there's something not quite right about this, um, but he just continues to ask David what's going on. And we see that David deceives Ahimelech and says he's on a mission from the king, which was not true. Uh, we see in chapter 21 that the things that David does are not, they don't seem to be really God-seeking. Um, we see that he deceives Ahimelech, he, uh, at this point, thinks that he needs Goliath's sword. He says, can I have that? Remember, just a few chapters ago, he basically was saying that Goliath is coming with a sword, but I'm coming in the name of the Lord. But he, see, he thinks that he needs this sword. He takes it. And we see that he goes from there. He goes to Gath, and he tries to convince Achish that he's no threat. And so he decides to pretend like he's crazy. It says there's spittle falling from his beard. And so, again, he's, he's doing these things. You see over and over again, he's doing things in fear. He's fleeing. There's deceit. No mention of God anywhere in that chapter. And so we see he's not really in a good spot. But thankfully, in chapter 22, we see things turn around. In chapter 22, we see that David's no longer acting out of fear, but we see he starts to communicate with God again. We see he's praying to him. We see it's not only in that chapter, but in the chapters ahead. He's praying to God for direction, and not only is he praying, but he's obeying God. He's doing what God's telling him to do, and as he is kind of turning upward, we see that Saul is going down faster. We see that Saul goes to the priests, and even though Ahimelech didn't know he was deceived, Saul slaughters the priests. And the only one that escaped is Abiathar, which was, uh, I believe, the son of the high priest. He escapes, and we see a great turning point because David went from a, a chapter where he's in fear, and he's now trying to help this man. He says, look, don't worry, you're safe, because we are where God wants us to be. So again, we see a great turn in his life. But now we're going to turn to uh, 1 Samuel 23 and read the first section here. So starting in verse 1, it says, then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite the Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with, the, with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul and Saul said, God had delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in 
by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city of my, uh, for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hands of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we again come to this place to open your word. And every time your word is opened, you can work. And I just pray that you'd help us to rightly understand your word. I pray that as we study this, that we would learn some things from what David has done um, in the past, and that we would take it as maybe something that would prompt us in our everyday life. It would be something that maybe would convict us about something in our life that shouldn't be there. Lord, there's so many ways in which you can work, and I pray that you'd help us to know exactly what you have for each and every one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we see here in verses 1 through 6 what I would like to call an honest prayer life. You know, we know that when we pray, what we ought to do is ask the Lord for something and say, Lord, what is it you'd have me to do? And as soon as we know what that is, to go forward and do it with no questions asked. To do it in faith and to trust God with all the results. But let's see what happens here in verse 1. It says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. A problem comes up in Keilah. So again, if you're looking at a map here, Keilah's kind of on the west part of where Judah was, and it's kind of near where the Philistines would be. And so it says that the Philistines came against Keilah, and um, we see here that in verse 2, he inquires of the Lord. He says, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. A direct answer. Go and defend that city. But look what happens in verse 3. And David's men said unto him, behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And so he knows what God wants. But then he goes and... I'm sure the men had the best of intentions, saying, look, here's something to consider. We're in a bad spot. And so we see that David could have said, you know what? The Lord has said we're going to go, so don't even worry about it. We're going. Let's trust God. And this is not a lapse in faith. This is just, he could have said that, but in verse 4 we see he inquires again. Then David inquired the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. You know, that is just a picture of how we can be. That we can have something from God that is just very clear. You know, it could be that in a service we feel conviction about something, and we make a decision for the Lord, and we are going to do that thing. And then we leave... And we start to think about it. We start to maybe ask people, what do you think about this? And maybe those people are doing things, saying things in your best interest. They may not be doing it for evil gain. They say, but what about this? You know, if you go and do this particular thing, you know, what if you run out of money? What if it's dangerous to go and do that thing? Is that the responsible thing to do, given that you have, you know, a family or this or that? They may have the best of intentions, but here's the thing. When it comes to what God has told us to do, we should do what he says right away. We should do that. But here's the thing. Even though that's what we should do, I am so thankful that we have a God that understands our frailties. That when we go away and we say we're going to do something for God and we start to fear, he lets us come back to him and ask him again. He is such a patient God. How often we question him, and we have no grounds to do that. We question him, and he still will give us that answer. You know, sometimes, like with the kids, you know, you can't, especially when you have nine of them, okay, you can't just say, go and do this, kind of to the masses, okay? If you say, 
we want the house clean or something like that, then what happens is there's all kinds of chaos. You know, no one knows what they're doing. This person's not working hard enough. And so sometimes you have to just get down on their level and just kind of look them in the eye and say, okay, I want you to do exactly this and not anything else. I want you to clean the kitchen and don't do anything else. If the baby's crying, don't do anything else. Just clean the kitchen. You make it so clear. And then a couple minutes go by, and then maybe one of the kids come back and say, what did you say to do again? What, what am I supposed to do? And I'm just like, I couldn't have been more clear with you. I looked you in the eyes. I squatted down, which hurts now. I'm older. And I told you what to do. But the thing is that God is willing to do that for us. That when we have questions, even though he's been so clear, he doesn't just say, you know what? I'm bringing a plague upon you. How dare you ask me again? You know what I want. But he is a gentle God. And so he inquires, and God doesn't say, how dare you? He says, go. Just like I said, go, and I'll deliver, I'll deliver them into your hands. And look what happens here. We see in verse 5 and 6 that he goes... And so, so David and his men went to the Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away the cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And it came to pass when Abiathar the son of Ahimelech fled down to Keilah that he came down with an ephah in his hand. So again, we see here that God did give them the victory. But there's something also I want you to notice here in verse 3. Coming back to these men here. And David's men said to him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? We see here that in this response, what these men were saying was effectively this. We're in a bad spot, and therefore, we can't go to a place that's in a worse spot. We just can't do it. It's, it's scary just where we're at, because remember that when it came to David, he was actually outside of Judah, and God, God called him back into Judah. It was a fearful thing because Saul was looking for him. And so the men are saying, it's scary just right now. If we go down to Keilah against the Philistines, we have Saul coming from this way. That's too scary. We can't do it. And the thing is, we cannot excuse ourselves from God's work when we're going through scary things. A lot of times when we go through difficult times, we kind of identify with the crisis. You know, if we're you know, having issues with health or relationships or at work, then we're all about, I'm having a difficult time in this area. And when these opportunities come to minister or maybe to work in this area, we say, I just can't do that right now because I have too much on my mind. I have too many things that are, you know, I, that are just kind of rattling around my brain. I can't do that right now. But what we have to realize is, that some of the best opportunities to glorify him are in those times. You know, when it comes to the stock market, the, 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 the tip is buy low and sell high. If you, you buy low and sell high, you make a profit. And so what happens is, the way you want to do this is, if a stock is, say, worth $100, and all of a sudden, there's a downturn. There's some you know, political thing happening in Asia. And it goes down to 10. That's when you want to buy. You want to buy in the dips, is what they call it. When it's dipped down, buy it when it's low, so that when it recovers, you make a big profit. What we have to remember is that when we are in a bad spot, it's like a, an opportunity to invest. When I'm in a dip, when things are going awful, that is when I can glorify God the most. When it comes to your neighbor... Let's say they have a need. Let's say it's a financial need. Is it going to impact them as much if they need $1,000 and they know that you're making millions? It's not going to be that big a deal. But here's the thing. If you're one that is not making hardly anything and the Lord impresses upon you and says, you know what, I want you to give to that need. What's going to impact that neighbor more? When you're sky high making millions or when you're in a situation where it's tough? Maybe you have someone that, you know, is uh, at work and they are just running ragged, okay? And you say, you know what? I want to be a blessing to them. I'm going to take over some of their load. Is that going to impact them as much if you are basically just, you know, taking it easy, only working 20 hours a week? Or if you're working super hard and you still take on that load? Which one's going to impact them? That's going to impact them when you're at the dip. And so again, we see here that they had excused themselves, said, it's too fearful, we can't keep going. 
But that was a great opportunity to, um, to uh, magnify the Lord and glorify Him. And so we see that when they went down there, they got the victory. And again, we kind of, we get in this, this mindset of, you know, there's David winning another victory. You know, just another one. You know, not a big deal. There's just a verse here about it. But remember, these are people that are afraid. They're going down there. Do you think that didn't help their faith a little bit? To say, we're going into an impossible situation, and they won. The Lord had delivered them into their hands. And so again, what a great blessing that they experienced there. But look at verse 7. In verse 7 and 8, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this the attitude of a deceived Christian. Now again, back then, I know they weren't Christians. They were either godly or ungodly. They were righteous or unrighteous. I'm not going to get into a debate about whether Saul's in heaven or not, okay? But what I'm saying is that this is kind of the attitude of someone that is living for the flesh, but convinced they're walking with God. Look what happens in verse 7. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, and Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand. For he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. We see here that Saul was basing, he was saying, God has delivered them into my hands. And what was the basis for that statement? Because of the circumstances. He was looking at the circumstances, and by those, he was concluding God had done this. God had delivered David into his hands. And that's one thing that we have to be very careful for, is that we cannot confuse circumstances with a walk with God. Um, I've talked to many people um, at the door, and uh, everyone, I, well, today it's actually more rare. Back in the day, again, I've seen it a lot today. Back in the day, okay, most people you talk to would say, I'm Christian, okay? Um, yes, I'm Christian. You know, I've got, I go to church. Where? Oh, I don't know. Church over there. Who's the pastor? I, I don't know. You know, that type of thing. Everyone's a Christian. Well, sometimes I'd ask, well, you know, what makes you a Christian? How do you know that you're a Christian? And a lot of times what they'll say is, well, because I'm blessed. I mean, I'm in a house that I love. Um, you know, all my relationships are going well. I have a job where I'm earning a lot of money. I remember one person said that the reason why they knew they were saved was because they had a big boat. They said, you see that boat over there? That's how I know I'm saved, because God is blessing. And so these people were looking at circumstances and saying, because I have these things, I must be blessed of God. Or when it comes to decisions that are made, whether it's a lost person or a Christian, I've heard many times, well, how did you know that was the right decision to make? And they'll say, well, everything opened up. You know, the way things worked out, only God could have worked out the details in that. But I just caution you. Don't you think that Satan can make circumstances work out to allure someone from God? Do you think that's possible? What did Satan offer Jesus? Did he offer destruction? What did he offer him? The kingdoms of the world. We have to be so careful that we don't confuse circumstances with God's blessing. Let me tell you about a man. There was a man once. And he was one that had pretty much nothing. He was pretty poor. And he was poor and he worked like a dog. He just worked and worked with very little to show for it. And one day an opportunity came up. And in this opportunity, he had the opportunity to be a national hero. And not only was he going to be a national hero, but he was going to gain a great reward if he just went through with this thing, this opportunity. And some would look at that and say, whoa, he must be blessed of God. Look at the things that have been presented to him. National hero, great reward. That's the story of Judas. When you think about it, Israel, the Jews, wanted Jesus to be done because he was causing all kinds of problems and Judas could have been the one to bring him down. And they, he, I'm sure that they would have just loved him and said, Judas is the one that took down Jesus and could have celebrated him. And he was going to get a reward. But the Bible says, Woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. We have to be careful. Because 
What we call an opportunity may be something that is of Satan. Here's another man. He was a military leader. He was doing good, but the opportunity for advancement was pretty much dead. You know, there was a king. The king was in charge. He had no reason to think the king would, you know, put him to a place of, you know, next in line. And that king died. And then what happened was another man rose up and said, I'm going to be king. But the soldiers said, you know what? We're not going to accept you as king. They kill that. Well, okay, they, they basically force him to kill himself in a sense. He kills, you know, he, he dies and they say, I want you, you military leader, I want you to be the king. And this king was a military genius, advanced the borders of his nation. And many would say, wow, God has blessed that man. He was not even supposed to be king, and all of a sudden he's the king. And on top of that, he's just expanding the borders. Got to be blessed of God. That man was Omri. He was the father of Ahab. It says in 1 Kings 16, 15, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. We have to be careful. Saul surely thought he was blessed the way he was speaking, but he wasn't. He was not being blessed. He was deceiving himself into thinking because the circumstances were lining up that God was blessing him. But now let's come back to the, the passage here. We see in verse 9 through 12 a great potential for misunderstanding God's plan. In verse 9 it says, And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. And so again, David's aware of what's going on. Saul's coming. Saul is coming. His fears are being confirmed, and so he goes to God. Good move. He goes to God in verse 11. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And so he goes to God, and we see that what God says, and the Lord said, he will come down. I can't speak for David, but I'm sure that's not the answer he was hoping for. He was maybe hoping for, no, Saul's not coming down, or don't worry, I have a plan for you, do this. But he says, no, he's coming down. Verse 12, then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. We see here that God directly told him to go to Keilah. We see that David and his men knew that they'd be in a vulnerable spot. And when David prays for clarification, he confirms his worst fear. Yes, Saul's coming. And the people you're with are not going to help you. They're not going to defend you. And these are the types of moments where we start to question God. God said he wanted me to do something, and I followed him faithfully, and I went to this place. And when I got here, there was a dead end. When I got here, there was trouble. When I got here, all these things happened that I didn't think should have happened. Because here's the thing what we do. We go to God, and we say, God, I'm willing to follow you. But in our back pocket, we have expectations about what should happen. We say, God, I'm going to take this first step because I know that this is going to happen next. And when it doesn't happen, we start to question God. One of our biggest enemies in life is having expectations like that. Now, having expectations and believing God's promises are different things. We can believe God's promises every day. But when it comes to the specifics about how things are going to play out, we cannot go into them with expectations. It says basically saying, God, I'm going to follow you as long as you go my way in the end. We have expectations about how people ought to act, how people ought to treat us, how people ought to behave. And when those don't happen, what happens? It's getting too hard to minister to them. I can't handle this anymore. I thought that they'd be more appreciative. Or we may have expectations how things ought to go. And when they don't go that way, we get upset. Or we say, you know what? If I do these things, these should be the results. You know what? 
I've eaten healthy and I've exercised daily and that's how you live a long life. How could it be that the doctor just told me I'm going to live to the age of 35? How could that be? Healthy people live a long time. I've been so responsible with my money. There were people, my friends, they went out and they just splurged on vacations. They splurged on every toy they could get. I've been careful with what you've given me, God. And I thought for sure that meant financial security. And now it's all gone. How could that be? I thought I was doing the right thing. How could this be taken? I've been so careful. It's because when we went into those things, we had an expectation. That if I am a wise steward, there's no way God will take this security blanket away from me. If there's a discrepancy between our plan and God's plan, we have got to scrap our plan. We have to give it up. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I've kind of got into recently is woodworking, when I can get a minute out there. And um, I'm learning. I don't know a lot of things. And um, sometimes I have an idea of what to do in a situation. And I know that that could be disaster, so I make sure that I ask my, my uh, you know, the one I'm kind of apprenticing under, Ryan Rich, okay? He knows a lot about uh, woodworking. And I'll ask things like, you know, like I'm making this tabletop thing. I'm like, I'm just going to take that tabletop and just go zip, zip, zip. I'm going to put some big screws down, and I'm going to be done with that tabletop. I'm so excited. And he's like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Like, why? I mean, just screw wood down. It's over. Well, the thing is that wood expands uh, through the seasons, and if you do that, you might crack that tabletop. I'd really use these fasteners. And he sends me a video, and it's like using a technique I've never done. It's going to take extra time. I have to space them just right, and, and it's just like, I want to do it my way. Six screws, it's over. I don't have to worry about it. Maybe it won't expand. I'll just keep it in a perfect environment that where the temperature just goes one or two degrees above, I never have to worry about it. And so I have a choice. Go with my plan, which I know is going to be disaster. That's fast and easy. Or go with the plan that's the right way to go. When it comes to God's plan, we need to go to it and say, Lord, this is what I think is going to happen, but I'm willing to do whatever. Now again, I'm not saying that David doubted God here. But I could see, like humanly speaking, how that might be something that would enter his mind. You know, I thought that this is the way it was going to end, but it didn't. And so what we see here is that he goes from there. So look in verse 13. Let's look at the unexpected blessing of following God here. In verse 13, Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed at Akilah, and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds, and remained in a mountain, in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And so we see that he leaves. Um, so again, Keilah is kind of on that western border with the Philistines. He then travels about 25 to 30 miles east. And so now he's kind of gone back um, to the east, away from Keilah. And so he's in this, you know, this particular place, Saul's seeking after him, and God will not deliver um, David to Saul. In verse 15, And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And so again, he's on the run here. Okay, He's, he's trying to get away from Saul. But look at the blessing in verse 16. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Remember, when they left... It all, for all intents and purposes, looked like this was the end in terms of seeing Jonathan. But we see that in, if they would have stayed in Keilah, this maybe never would have happened. In leaving Keilah, he has this opportunity to see Jonathan again and see what happens here in verse 17. And he said to him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. And they too made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. We see here that there was a great blessing here, first off, because if he had not gone there, he wouldn't have seen Jonathan. And in that, we see that there was a blessing in the midst of the difficulties. One thing that's very helpful 
is that either if you're going through a difficult time or maybe you're at the tail end of a difficult time, to stop and ask the question, what have I gained from this? Now, of course, we don't go into things to gain for ourselves. We do those things to glorify God. But God has promised us that as we follow him, we will bear more, for, more fruit and we're going to have reward and joy. But to go through those difficult times and say, Lord, and going through that difficult time, what, has, what have I been blessed with? It could be a different perspective. It could be more patience. It could be more fruit. It could be an opportunity to minister to someone that maybe you wouldn't have been able to minister to. We need to take time to see why did we go through that? It's important. If you don't do that, then you start to view life as a bunch of annoying things that happened. And that's not the right way to look at it. How has God used this in my life? And so again, we see that he gets that opportunity to be with Jonathan. But here's the second thing we can learn from Jonathan. And that was the fact that Jonathan was an encouragement to David. You know, there's a couple things that we have to keep in mind. Number one is that none of us really fully know what's going on in each other's lives. Now, of course, there's some that we kind of keep up with a little bit more. But in terms of if you see people at church, we often put forth our best face. Okay, It's not hypocritical. I just think that when we come to church, we have a, we have a, a reason to be here, and that is to glorify the Lord. We come here to worship Him. We want to be an encouragement to one another. And so we try to put our best foot forward. Okay, So we come to church. We say, God bless you. Have a good day. It's a great day worshiping Him. But in terms of knowing what we're going through, the depths of it, we don't really know. Sometimes we think, well, you know, they seem so happy at church. They must just be having the time of their life. You know, they don't have any difficulties. That's not the case. We all have difficulties. But here's the second thing. We need to remember that we all are capable of stumbling, of tripping. The best of us doubt sometimes. The best of us fear sometimes. We need to keep that in mind and don't think we're the only ones in that camp. And so what I see in, in Jonathan here is one that encouraged David at the exact right time. And what we can do as an application is be prayerful. I mean, how often have you prayed about something and said, Lord, lay someone upon my heart that I can pray for. Or lay someone upon my heart that I might be a blessing to and God gives you someone and you're like, why? Like, not that like they're, I don't like them, but it's like, you know, everything seems to be fine with them. And then you try to be an encouragement to, you, to them, and you find out that they needed that so much. That's happened to me so many times where I've had just difficult days, difficult weeks. I'm down, and then out of nowhere, I'll get a card that just says, you know, I appreciate what you do. And that type of thing can mean so much. And so I'd encourage you, be prayerful about how you might be able to meet someone in Ziff and be a blessing to them. Even though you may not know exactly what's going on in their life, be willing to do that. Be prayerful and be a blessing. And so we see that there is a blessing here, but let's continue on the story. We're running out of time. Look at verse 19. <clears throat> we see here that God delivers through circumstances. In verse 19, then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood, in the hill of Hakala, which is on the south of Jeshimon? We see here the Ziphites decide, we're going to follow Saul. We're going to help him out. They come up to see Saul. And in verse 20, Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the, into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord. We see here he's blessing them on behalf of God. Again, he's, in, he's, he's deceived himself. For ye have compassion on me. Go, I pray you, prepare yet, and know, and see his place where his haunt is. And who has seen him there, for has told me that he dealeth very subtly. He says, go back, don't let him know what you're up to. Go back and see where he hangs out. Where is he at so that if I can get his location, I'm going to come after him? See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself, and come ye again to me with the certainty, and I will go with you, and it shall come to pass, if he had been in the land, that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. And so he sends these men back as spies to figure out where is David. But look at the first way in which God uh, delivers him. 
In verse 25, Saul also, wait, sorry, and then, let's see. And they arose, verse 24, and they arose and went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men were on the wilderness, or in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. We see here the first way he delivered was getting him out of there before this trap could be hatched. And so that was the first thing. So then when Saul comes, he was going to be on a wild goose chase looking for David. But look at the next way here in verse 25. Saul also and his men went to seek him, and they told David, Wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul went on, the, on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men uh, compassed David and his men around about to take them. So again, there's this chase going on. He's trying to get away. But then we see verse 27. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called the place Selah Hamalakoth. We see that God delivered through the circumstances yet again. The Philistines were approaching and Saul left. Now, remember, God has a perfect will. Okay, his perfect will is, maybe in this situation for Saul, is for Saul to realize that David is God's man, that, that Saul would say, you know, whatever God you want, I'm willing to do that. I'm repenting. Whether I'm the king, he's the king, I'm going to do whatever you want, God. That would have been the best case scenario. But there's some things that even if people go against God's perfect will, God will not allow. And this was one thing that God was not going to allow. He was not going to let Saul catch David. And so he stepped in. He intervened by having the Philistines attack. And so again, we see that God can intervene with circumstances, and he's done that throughout history. And, um, you know, when I see those things, we know that we all have a free will, okay? We can do, you know, within reason what we want, okay? God doesn't make us do anything. He gives us decisions to make, and we have to act in faith or not. We can act in fear, or we can walk with him. And, to, I don't know if you've done this, but just to stop and to think about the history of your life and say, you know, I really could have easily done this instead. Like when I was at that point in my life, I could have easily gone this way and that would have been awful. You know, I think about it, you know, and I'm sure you guys could tell stories too, how many times I should have died as a child. I mean, I was crazy the things that I did. You know, ask the teens uh, how many stories I've told them about ways I wish I should have died because I was being stupid as a kid. The fact that God protected me, he wouldn't let me die. The fact that when it came to schools, like, I was decided, I was certainly going to go to the East Coast. I went to visit there first. I was like, I'm going there. I was going to go to Cornell. I got all the stickers and the bumper stickers and the buttons and the books and everything. Like, not the textbooks, but everything. I was going to Cornell. And then I was like, you know, I have a free trip to Illinois. I guess I could go there. And so I come to Illinois, and I'm there with my friends, and I'm like, I got to come here. That could have easily gone the other way. I could have just said, you know, I don't want to make the trip to Illinois. What's Illinois? Okay? I could have had that attitude. But God brought me here, and he changed my mind. When it comes to 9-11, when that happened, I'm sure you guys can all remember when that happened. Those are old enough. I was that close to moving back to Oregon. That scared me. And if I would have moved back to Oregon, I wouldn't have come to this church. I may not have ever been saved. But God put circumstances so I couldn't move back to Oregon. These things happen throughout our lives because God sometimes protects us from ourselves. And so when those things are, it's again, it's such a good thing to go back and think about it and say, God, thank you so much for that. Thank you for protecting me from this situation. Thank you for helping me to make this decision that I was teetering on. And just take a hold of where you're at and say, you know what, Lord, thank you for putting me here. I want to use this for you. 
And so again, great, a great uh, passage here, things to think about. In conclusion, number one, are you letting circumstances drive your decisions? I hope that's not the case. If you're praying to God, and God's giving you the green light and giving you direction, of course circumstances can play a part, of it, part in it, but we shouldn't let it be the prime factor. And number two, when you obey God, are you obeying with some sort of expectation in your back pocket? You should obey him and say, Lord, wherever it leads me, I know it's the best place. Think on these things here tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And there's a lot of things we can learn here, and they're easy to say, but they are very difficult to follow. I pray that you just impress upon us maybe a decision we have now, maybe um, something that uh, is going on in our lives that maybe these would speak to. And I pray that you give us the courage to not do the comfortable thing, but to do what you would have us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're not going to have an invitation, um, but again, uh, think on these things throughout the week. Have a blessed week. God bless you.